Hello everyone. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today morning. Uh, I we will be starting on time uh, within another five minutes. So thank you for joining us today morning, and we hope you enjoyed this webinar. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Thank you everyone for joining. We'll be starting in two minutes.
All right, let's begin. Thank you everyone for joining us today morning for uh, the Amherst Green Building Council's technical webinar for June. Uh, today we'll be talking about a very, very important topic on uh, new generation refrigerants, uh, which is being facilitated by Amherst GBC corporate member train. So before we begin, let me just uh, introduce myself and for those of you joining us first time for our webinar. So my name is Jason John and I work as the technical engineer for the Emirates Green Building Council. Uh, if you don't know about the Emirates Green Building Council, just here's a bit of an overview. So we're a nonprofit uh, NGO that was formed in 2006 with the goal of advancing green building principle. We operate as a membership organization with our members receiving uh, many benefits for being one of our corporate members. Uh, our vision is for the UAB, UAE to be a global leader for sustainability in the built environment. And our mission is for the EGBC to act as a, a hub for collaboration and excellence to promote sustainability. So a bit of housekeeping before we begin. Um, everyone will see on the right hand side, there's a control panel uh, there for the platform. So during the presentation, we won't be taking any verbal questions. So your microphones will remain muted throughout the webinar. But if you have any questions during the presentation or after, uh, you can add in your questions in from the right hand side in the questions area. We will be monitoring those questions. So if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, reach out uh, and we will have a small q a session towards the end of the presentation to address those questions uh, we will also be sharing a recording of the presentation after the event so have to keep a lookout for that in your registered emails uh, please do complete the exit survey as uh, you are leaving the webinar and finally follow us uh MS GBC on our social media to keep updated on our upcoming events and announcements so Without further ado, let me introduce our facilitator for today, uh, Mr. Saeed Alham from Train. Uh, Mr. Saeed has 25 experience in air conditioning and refrigeration industry. He's a diversified experience in Canada and Middle East, includes design and project management. He is also lead accredited professional, CEM and Pearl qualified professional. He joined Train in uh, UAE in 2009 and has since worked with design engineers and consultants to develop innovative energy efficient and environmentally sustainable solutions so that's it from my side i will now be handing over to mr said who will continue uh, and brief us on this very important topic so mr said i'm making you the presenter right now and the floor is yours thank you so much um Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Jason, for uh, your effort and for your leadership and uh, for bringing this, uh, this, uh, this event. Uh, thanks also to the EGBC for taking that important role in uh, the sustainability and the environment. And uh, thank you all for your time and interest to, to, to attend this webinar. Uh, I believe this webinar is having a very important topic, which is uh, relevant to our environment. So it's important to, to see what's happening in the in the refrigerants and the, and the HVAC industry as well. I'll remove the camera and focus on the presentation. Um, I, I hope you see my, uh, my screen. Yes, we can see it. Uh, Mr. Say, we, uh, we can just see uh, the bottom uh, part of the present, uh, the task bar. So if you can just minimize that and just, yeah. Think. Let me back to minimize this now. Okay, no problem. Let's go to the, the presentation. Okay. Um, Sorry about that, but uh, okay. Uh, so at least you see the uh, the presentation slide clearly, right? 
So yeah, I think it's fine. We can we can continue. Okay, so our agenda or learning objectives today is to have uh, an overview of the brief history of the refrigerants. We will go through the Montreal Protocol and the latest amendment, which is Kigali Amendment. We will have a look at the regulatory update uh, about the refrigerants. We will compare the alternatives, which is available now. We will go uh, through some examples of applications, such as data centers and the electrification of heating to see the importance of the R1234 ZE refrigerant on these sectors. And then we will have the summary. Now, humankind started using refrigerants as early as 830s. Now, from, from 830s till 1930s, we call it the first generation refrigerant. We use whatever worked. Now, safety and stability were not really a priority. Refrigerants were used in limited industrial applications and had a high cost. Uh, refrigerants such as ammonia, which is highly toxic, were used. Refrigerants such as hydrocarbons, which is highly flammability, were used. Then from 1930s to 1990s, we call it the second generation refrigerants. The focus of innovation was on refrigerants to have safety and stability. And that enabled exponential, exponential societal improvement, including the usage of refrigeration in, in, uh, in homes and also using of air conditioning in residential buildings and in commercial buildings. We use refrigerants, which is CFCs, and HCFCs such as R11, R12, and R22. The third generation uh, from 1990s to 2010 focused on ozone protection. It preserved the second generation innovations such as safety, stability, and efficiency. HFCs and HCFCs refrigerants were used such as R123, R134A407, and R410. The last generation or the fourth generation from 2010 onwards focused on additional challenge, which is the global warming. So options became uh, more limited. I mean, like if you add safety, stability, efficiency, ozone protection, and, and the global warming, your options becomes more narrow and more, more uh, limited. Also in the fourth generation, the safety and design uh, guidelines have been revisited to arrange the priorities. Now the global warming was not a priority, now it becomes a priority. So a kind of slight flammability becomes, becomes uh, acceptable, as we will see later. Uh, there's also an, uh, a renewed interest in the natural refrigerants, such as carbon dioxide and HCs. But the major breakthrough and the innovation came from, from the invention of the HFOs, or hydrofluoroelephants, as we will see, as we will see later. Now, in, in the past, we used uh, CFCs, refrigerants such as R11 and R113 and R22. A CFC is a chlorofluorocarbon, which is composed from carbon atom, chloride atom, and fluoride, fluoride atoms. Now, these refrigerants had excellent stability and efficiency, but scientists found that CFCs caused a hole in the, in the ozone layer. The chloride molecule is responsible for that. So what is ODB? ODB is the ozone depletion potential. It is the degree to which a substance can degrade the ozone layer relative to a similar mass of R11. So if R11 has an index of one, other refrigerants is measured relative to, to R11. So we call these refrigerants, the CFCs, as ODS, which is ozone depleting substances. It was determined that either by combining the chlorine atom with hydrogen atom, this would form uh, an HCFC, which is hydrochlorofluorocarbon. Or if we remove the, the, chlor the chlorine uh, atom altogether, we have the HFC, which is hydrofluorocarbon. Uh, so in this case, the ozone depletion potential of that refrigerant effectively went to zero. So uh, scientists uh, moved quickly from using the CFCs to refrigerants such as R134A, 410, 407, and R123. Then scientists determined that the fluorocarbons are greenhouse gases with a net measurement of the GWP. The GWP is the global warming potential. 
and it is the degree to which the greenhouse gas traps heat in the atmosphere. So all the measurements of the refrigerants of GWP are relative to the similar mass of carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is indexed to, to value of one. So refrigerant, for example, like R134A has a global warming potential of 1,300. So that is one mass of R134A equivalent to one mass of carbon dioxide. It is 1,300 times more than the carbon dioxide. Um, lower GW refrigerants were developed, such as 513A, R32, and 452, and with significantly lower GWP, which is moved like from 1,300 and higher to, to the range of, for example, 513A, it has zero ODB and global warming potential of seven. Now, finally, 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 the best uh, balance approach uh, refrigerants are the ultra low GWP solutions. These are HFOs and HFOs blends, such as R1233ZD, R1234ZE, R1234YF, and 514FG blend. Now, what makes these refrigerants really unique and major breakthrough is that it has a zero ODP and also has very low global, warm very low global warming potential. Now let's have more illustration about uh, how the equipment and HVAC and refrigerant, how really it affects the, the atmosphere. When we use HVAC equipment, we have two types of emissions. One type is direct and another type is indirect emission. Now, if we start with the indirect emission, the indirect emission results from the power consumption or energy consumption. As we know, every kilowatt hour consumed by the HVAC equipment, it comes like from power generation plant that may use fossil fuel, like a fossil fuel uh, to burn fuel. So it has it has a carbon footprint. For example, for one kilowatt hour, maybe we will have an impact of about 1.4 pound of carbon dioxide released in the atmosphere. That depends on the efficiency of the power generation plant. So it is very important to focus on energy efficiency of refrigerants. We need to focus on energy efficiency of the equipment, such as chillers. Not only that, but also to focus on the energy efficiency of the systems. And by looking to the systems, we will find some opportunities for improving energy efficiency and reducing the indirect carbon footprint. We will see some examples for that. Now, the other type, which is the direct emission, it comes from the release of the refrigerant to the ambient. Now, as long as we have the refrigerant inside the HVAC equipment, there is no direct emission. But as we know, equipment may leak, it may have some accidents or end of service. So release of the refrigerant to the atmosphere will, will affect, will affect the, the atmosphere. Now, as you see here in the illustration on the left, we live on the troposphere. So any refrigerant which leaks, leaks from, you know, on the earth, on the troposphere but it will travel to the ozone layer and to the stratosphere. Now, we know that the ozone layer is very important to protect the Earth from the harmful rays from the sun. And we know that there has been a problem which was addressed in Montreal Protocol in 1980s. And the good news is that the ozone layer has been healing. So the hole in the ozone layer has been shrinking after taking action. But now the challenge is, is happening in the stratosphere. As we see here, the Earth received the sun rays absorb the heat and reflect it back to the space to, the, to, affect, to, to, to achieve the balance in the, in the heat transfer. The problem is with the greenhouse gases, such as refrigerants and such as carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, is that it traps the heat here. So instead of releasing the, the heat back to the space, it reflects it back to the earth and that's causing increase in the temperature of, of the earth, gradual, gradual and small one, but it has a very significant effect on the climate of the Earth. If we see the R134A molecule, uh, which is having a GWP of 1,300, it lives about 15 years. Okay, so the life of the molecule of the R134A about 15 years. It needs about four to six years to, to, to reach the stratosphere. 
So there will be some R134A trapped in the stratosphere. And, and that causes, as we mentioned, the global warming. As we mentioned, one molecule of R134A, similar mass, about 1,300. Now, if we see here in the top, we have refrigerants, which is HFOs, such as 1233ZD and 1234ZA. The lifetime of this molecule is about 29 days, so it decomposes uh, very quickly once it's released uh, from, from the ambient. Now, if we see here the difference between the HFCs and HFOs, we see here the HFC molecule has double has has one bond between the two carbon atoms, which is a strong bond. So the lifetime of, of the R134A is long, it's about 15 years. Now, HFO molecules has double bond between the two carbon atoms. So while the molecule is stable inside the equipment, once it's released to the ambient, it quickly decomposes. The sun rays like the ultraviolet, the UV rays and the oxygen will help the HFO to decompose quickly in a matter of days rather than a matter of, my, of years. So what makes really the, the, the HFOs and the refrigerants unique is the atmospheric life. Because atmospheric life, it really uh, affects how much of the impact of the refrigerant it has on the, on the atmosphere. It affects if it will reach the stratosphere or it will reach the ozone layer. So the lifetime or the atmospheric lifetime of refrigerant is, is a key factor. Now let's look to the next topic, which is Montreal Protocol. Uh, let's look to the latest uh, amendment, which is Kigali, Kigali Amendment. Uh, Montreal Protocol is a global Montreal Protocol is a global treaty, and its agreement to eliminate the use of the ozone depleting substances. It was signed in 1987, and now also it's also framed for uh, phasing, for addressing the global warming as well. Now, in October 2016, 197 countries met in Kigali in Rwanda to amend Montreal Protocol and to phase down HFCs globally. This is 85% reduction by year 2036 in developed countries and reduction by 80% by year 2045 in most developing countries. Now, while the agreement provided a kind of framework or plan for HFC reductions, each country will choose how they will meet the required reductions outlined in Kigali Amendment. So every country will have its own plan. Now, as of uh, November 2017, 87 countries has ratified Kigali Amendment, which makes it legally binding, even for the countries who did not ratify the agreement yet. Because ratifying countries will, non-ratifying countries will be subject to trade restrictions in the future. So the, the Kigali Amendment now is legally binding even for the countries who did not ratify the agreement. Now, we have about 121 countries who ratified the agreement. Uh, all of the European countries had, uh, and also countries like Canada, Japan, uh, Mexico, and many developing countries, about 121 countries ratified, ratified the, the agreement. Now, USA is a unique case. We will look into USA, what happened in USA. This is still to ratify the agreement. Also, GCC countries uh, still did not ratify the agreement, and there is need to work on the regulations in UAE and GCC countries to, to update the regulations and compliance with Kigali amendment is also expected, it's a matter, it's, it's matter of time. Now we see, for example, in UAE and GCC countries that changes uh, in the refrigerants and the HVAC equipment has already happened, even though the regulations for phasing down the HFC is still not in place. I mean, for example, if you go for centrifugal chillers, you will see now many installation in UAE and in the region with a new generation refrigerant like 1233ZD and 514A, including landmark and big projects about six years ago. So the change has already happened, even in our region, even though the, the regulations in the GCC countries are not still updated to, to, to comply with Kigali Amendment. Now, what is the significance of the Kigali Amendment or the the amendment of Montreal Protocol under Kigali Amendment. What is the significance or importance of that? As we mentioned earlier, it's a platform for phasing down the HFCs. It avoids about 80 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent cumulative through 2050. 
if that was not in place, we would have about 80 billion metric tons released to the ambient because of refrigerant. And that would have a very significant effect on the temperature rise of the globe. The expected rise would be about 0.5 degrees Celsius by year 2100, which is a major and dangerous effect on the, on the Earth. So that, that agreement enabled avoiding that temperature increase, as we see here in the illustration on the right side. Now, this slide gives uh, excellent illustration about the phasing down of HFCs, what's happening in the world. Now, in Montreal Protocol, we have uh, two groups of countries. We have the A2 countries or the developed countries. We call it non-Article A countries. That includes the European countries and developed, nation, developed countries such as uh, USA, Japan, and Canada. And we have also the Article 5 countries under Montreal Protocol, which is the developing countries. And it has also two groups, the group one and the group two. Now, if we see here under the purple or under the blue line, this is here the reduction in, uh, in Europe. As we see, the reduction in Europe has already started in 2016 and was reduced to 93 percent. It was reduced in 2018 to 63 percent. In this year, it is reduced to by 55 percent. That is now down to 45. Now we see here that the European Union countries are moving very fast and even moving faster than the requirements of Montreal Protocol for A2 countries. Now under the red line here, we see the phase down of HFC revisions in the developed countries. And one important, which is a key date, is year 2024. As you see here, a reduction by 40%, that is down 60% of the HFC refrigerant by year 2024. And as we will see in the regulations later, we can relate this date, which is year 2024, to some phase out or ban of equipment, mainly chillers, which is being stopped with HFC refrigerant by year 2024. And that also date is the freeze actually for uh, for the a, a group uh, for a group one of the Article 5 countries. Now, year 2029 is also a significant year. As you see here, we have also a major drop in the developed, in the developed countries, which is down to 30%. And many would interpret that these dates will be applicable for residential and unitary equipment phase out. Now, further reductions are, are tailed, let's say, to the, to the service and availability of, of the refrigerants. Now, if we look, if we look here for the Article 5 countries or developing countries, we have two groups, as we mentioned. So we have here reduction and we have here a group two. And in this group two, here we have uh, GCC countries and, and India. Now, this looks here to be uh, kind of relaxed timelines for group two. Now, we saw from the previous slide that Article 5 countries, Group 2, which is applicable to our region, has more relaxed timeline. But will this change really happen slowly or it will happen more quickly? This is an important question to ask. So to answer that question, maybe we need to look back to what happened in the past. If we look what happened to the CFC phasing out in the past, and if we see the reasons for what happened, we can predict, we can predict the future. If we see here, the developed nations were required to, to restrict the, the CFCs in year 1996, okay? And the actual phase out happened in 1994. So that was uh, two years ahead of, of the phase out plan. Now, developing countries were required to phase out their fusions in year 2010, but it was accomplished in year 1996. That is 14 years ahead of the plan. So while the developed countries accomplished two years ahead, developing countries accomplished 14 years ahead. So there is a big difference here. And why is that? It's because of the technology. Now, mainly chillers, and in particular, the centrifugal chillers, it's coming like from USA or Japan or developed countries. That pulled the change to be faster. So the chillers with all the refrigerant, it became obsolete. It became obsolete technology. It became more expensive. There was no need to buy chillers with all generation refrigerant. 
So the change happened from economy and society and uh, point of view quicker than the regulation. There was no need to buy to buy chillers with all with obsolete technology. Now the same can apply also here if we see and we we already see it. Uh, for example, most of the centrifugal chillers also now comes from U.S. and developed countries, and it's already commercialized with refrigerants such as R1233ZD and 514A, and it has been used in UAE with landmark projects for the past six years. So chillers with centrifugal chillers with R134A will become obsolete, will become more expensive. There will be no need to keep the relaxed uh, timelines for phasing out of the of the HFC for that. Once we look to more regulation updates, we will see that the, the significance or the importance of, of phasing out chillers with all refrigerants. Now, if we have a look about the regulations worldwide, well, let's start with, with the USA. And USA is, is a leader in HVAC industry, as we know, and uh, it has also a big market, and also it has unique case because after the Kigali Amendment, uh, the EPS, EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, is a federal, it's a federal uh, entity in USA, came up in December uh, 2016 with, with a document or policy which is called the SNAP, which is a significant a new alternative policy program. And under that document, it, uh, it uh, regulates the refrigerants. So we have two rules, which is very applicable called Rule 20 and Rule 21, which are the most applicable for our HVAC industry. So that document, um, it, it was drafted to comply with Kigali Amendment. So if we look here about, let's say, some part of the uh, SNAP rules, which is SNAP 20, and if we look here for centrifugal chillers, for new centrifugal chillers, we see here refrigerants such as R134A, it will be unacceptable of January 2024. So as I mentioned, this is why the HFAC, HVAC manufacturers for chillers now developed chillers with a new generation refrigerant, which is not using R134A because after that date, you cannot get a new chiller with R134A. Same applies also for positive displacement chillers, which is known in the market. We have the screw chillers. It can be air-cooled screw chillers or water-cooled screw chillers. This is very applicable. Again, the R134A is not acceptable of January 2024. Now, it can be acceptable at a very limited use, such as military marine and spacecraft. So this, I, would, I would not consider this is, let's say, significant for us because this is a very limited use. So in January, so in general, the EPA uh, SNAP regulations will phase out HFCs and the most one which is in effect under pressure is the R134A. Now, uh, as we mentioned, the, the EPA is a federal uh, entity and it provided the, the frame for the phase down of the refrigerant to comply with Kigali Amendment. So what happened after that? Now, what happened after that in 2017, under the new administration, the EPA regulations were challenged, that it did not have enough regulations and legislation to pass such kind of regulations in the federal level. So the EPA SNAP uh, rules, Rule 20 and Rule 21 and other rules, could not come into effect in USA on the federal level. So when the EPA SNAP regulations were challenged, many states decided to proceed with their with the regulations on their own, which is in line with EPA. About 25 states, which is about 55% of the US population, so we have here half of the nation of USA states, decided to, to, to adopt the EPA uh, SNAP regulations and HFC phase down on their own. And this is about 60% of the GDP of USA. And in January, in, in June 2018, they formed something called the Climate Alliance. So we see here the states, which is in a blue and in a green, which is part of the, of the Climate Alliance. Now, states in green here are members of the Climate Alliance, Alliance, and they are still in the process of making regulations to comply with HFC uh, phase down. Uh, we see here states in the blue color are members of the Cli Climate Alliance, and they have already adapted HFC phase down, such as California, such as 
Washington, such as uh, New York and New Jersey and Maryland. So we have many states here which has already adopted the phase down of HFCs as per EDA. Now, for example, here, if we see for California, it only uh, not not only it, it applied the EPAs now, but also it took uh, further measures. I mean, like it took also uh, have more restrictions on HVAC systems such as leakage rates. We see also some states uh, like Washington, which developed the, which developed building codes to adopt refrigerants and using A2L A2L refrigerants. Now, what is the A2L and the classification of A2L? We will look to more slides and to understand the A2L classification in the next slides. But as we see here, when the when the EPA SNAP rules were challenged in 2017, we see that every state decided on its own about half of the USA to proceed with with the with the regulations of HMC as per EPA and as per Kigali requirements. Now. If we look in particular, for example, to California, so in California, we have the California uh, Air Resources Board, and they adopted to mandate to comply with the 40% protection, as we see here in the year 2024, as we saw from the previous slide, based on the baseline of 2011 and 2013. So when we say 40% protection, it's measured from a baseline. And the baseline was 2011 to 2013. That's the baseline for the HFC consumption. So California Air Resources Board or CARB decided to comply with 40% reduction. So hence EPA 20 and 21 rules uh, phase out for chillers with R134A came into effect of January 2024. And this is in line with EPA and also in line with the Kigali uh, reduction plans. Now, CARP analysis uh, show that regulations which is in place may not be enough to provide the fourth person. And that maybe will uh, provide like only 25% reduction in the, in, in the refrigerants. And additional restrictions will also be required. So residential and unitary VRF will also be regulated or it may be regulated by year 2023, which is very soon. And that will be to limit the, the global warming potential of these equipment to 750. Also, CARP regulation include refrigerant management, as we mentioned, as per EPA section 608, which is related for the refrigerant's application and the leakage rate and the management of the, of the refrigerant. Uh, in addition to that, uh, CARP uh, will come with also like more, uh, more guidelines not only to phase out the new equipment, as we mentioned, like chillers by year 2024, but also to take further measures to, to meet the 40% reduction. So maybe quotas and taxation will be applied on the refrigerant consumption to meet, to meet the reduction target. Now, if we go back to, uh, to the EPA, and if we go back to the, to the federal level in USA, Finally, we have the AIM Act, which is the American Innovation and Manufacturing Act, which came from uh, Senate in uh, last year, in 2020, came into effect also in this year. And under that, uh, under that act, which is a law, now EPA is required uh, or mandated for 15 years phase down out of HFC at national level. And this is happening for the first time. And this has to be administered by the EPA and which is aligned also with Kigali schedule. So even the process of implementing the EPA regulations from 2016, uh, we can see now that uh, the, the battle of having the proper legislation in order to implement the EPA regulations is already now in place. Maybe it took five years, but now it's in place. So now in the US, there's a federal, let's say, platform for phasing down the refrigerants. But as we mentioned, uh, from 2017, about 50% of the US states decided to start with the phasing down, irrespective of having the federal regulation. But this will give even more momentum, and this is important and significant, significant effect. So it requires EPA to implement 85% phase down of production and consumption of HFCs. So they will reach approximately 15% by 2030. 
of their 2011-2013 average. So this is here the baseline. So they want to achieve 85% reduction of that baseline by year 2036, which is so much in line with Kigali uh, agreement. It also authorizes the EPA to adopt sector-specific use restrictions, as we saw in SNAP 2021. It, it stops the chillers in year 2024 with HFC refrigerants, so it authorizes the EPA to do that. And also, it does not, let's say, exceed the existing uh, developing state HFCs. So the AIM Act is not more, is not faster, is not slower than the, the regulations which has been taken by the states, as we saw in California and in New York. If you want to get more information about the EPA and the SNAP, you can visit this link to get now the update about the AIM Act, which gave uh, to, to, to EPA. Now, if you look for the uh, Europe, Canada, and Japan as examples, as we mentioned in the previous slides, that Europe is leading the world phase down. It has aggressive phase down allocation as a section on HFCs. And instead of having wide and big uh, product done, uh, it, it lets the refrigerant rise and taxation of the, of the, of the refrigerants driving the change. It is worth mentioning that in new vehicles with refrigerants, for example, GWP uh, having more than 150 has been restricted or prohibited in Europe since 2017. So you will need, you see all, all in your, all in your vehicles coming with refrigerants, which is R1234YF instead of the R134A. Now in Canada, uh, update on regulations, we see that uh, chillers also would be stopped by year 2025, which is having uh, GWB less, uh, more than 2,200 or more than 750 by year 2025. The transport refrigeration would be phased out by year 2025, which is having higher than 2,200 GWB. Now, in addition to that, Canada applies not only a phase out for product with timelines, but also it applies uh, bulk HFC phase down, which is quota based and taxation of refrigerants about the, uh, the consumption. Uh, similar regulations also from Japan, to restrict the chillers with, uh, with GWP, so it must be restricted to 100 by year 2025. So as we see here, every country will have its own path uh, to phase down HFCs, but in general, it will be required to, to meet the uh, HFC uh, regulations and reductions as per Kigali Amendment. Am I moving fast or slowly? No, I now, think it's fine. Okay, good. good. Um, now, we, we look to the regulation from environment point of view. Now, let's look to the, in addition to the regulations, let's look to the standards. Uh, one of the important standards is ASHRAE 34. So, ASHRAE 34 is a standard where it lists the refrigerants. So, every new refrigerant which is developed by companies like Honeywell and Comoros Will be, up, will be added, and normally it will be added to the ASHRAE 34, and it will be classified under the ASHRAE 34. So every refrigerant is having designation and will be classified. Now, the classification of refrigerant safety, the class B has higher uh, toxicity, and the class A is having lower toxicity. So this is here increasing. And then we have vertically here the level of flammability, we have level one, level two, and level three. And as we see here in, in ASHRAE 34, 2010, a new class has been added, which is class A2L, because some refrigerants, it's not fair to classify it as a class A2. Refrigerants, for example, such as R1234 ZE is classified as A2L because its burning velocity is very low. So under A2L or B2L, the burning velocity of the refrigerant is less than 10. So this is classified by, by the ASHRAE as difficult to ignite and difficult to sustain uh, flame. So this, this class has been added in the ASHRAE. So as we see here, ASHRAE standards has been updated to accommodate refrigerants with lower flammability because these refrigerants have excellent merits in terms of 
the ozone depletion potential and in terms of the global warming potential. As we mentioned, GWB becomes now significant. So the safety, let's say, like having A2L becomes, becomes acceptable. Maybe in the past, the people used to look to it to a kind of more suspicious or more, let's say, conservative, but now it becomes more acceptable. And if we look, for example, for refrigerants such as R1234ZE, which is considered here as A2L, in Europe it's considered as safe and non-flammable. Now, there are refrigerants which is the hydrocarbons can be more flammable. Uh, refrigerants such as ammonia can be uh, flammable and it can be highly toxic. So there is no perfect refrigerant. Every refrigerant has its uh, safety, GWP, ODB, and, C and COP. Uh, characteristic which has to be evaluated for everyone. Now, in addition to that, actually 34, we have another important standard, which is actually 15. Actually 15 is an application standard, and it gives the basic rules of how and where refrigerants can be used in HVAC equipment and systems. And normally it's based on the input of actually 34 classification for refrigerants. So, for example, if you are a consultant, if you are designing, for example, a mechanical room with chillers installed indoor, like uh, energy center, it will give guidelines about the refrigerant monitoring and uh, in the in the plant room. Also, it gives guidelines about the, the ventilation requirements in case of refrigerant leakage. And building codes use that application. Uh, design guidelines to develop their uh, their building codes. So the ASHRAE 15 is very important input for the safety standards for refrigeration systems and for building codes, which is developed global wise. There are also more European standards, but most of the um, let's say uh, applicable standards are the ASHRAE 34 and 15, which is widely used in our region as well. Now we come to the to the second topic, which is the comparison of alternatives. And here we come more interesting, where we look really to what is available now. Okay, so let's see now what are our options and what we have and what choices can we make. Now to compare refrigerant options, we need to break down refrigerants into uh, classes. We have here the low pressure, medium pressure, and high pressure. We have uh, the past refrigerants, which is uh, gray. We have the transitions, which is orange. We have the low refrigerant, which is blue. And then we have the balanced approach or the ultra low GWP, which is in a green. Now, here we compare on the upper row, we compare the COP or the theoretical efficiency of the refrigerant. And here we compare the operating pressure. Now, as we see here, here we have the low pressure, we have here the medium pressure of the refrigerants, and we have here the high pressure, which is high. And here we compare the COP, okay? So, um, if we see here, like in every category, if we move from the old, which is like, for example, with the low pressure, we had R11 9.1, and then it was in the second generation, it was 8.9 and 8.8, .8, and the third generation, 8.8, 8.9. If we see here, there is a trend that, the new COP is of the new generation is less than the COP of the of the old of the old of the old generation. Uh, another observation that we can see is that the low pressure, uh, in general, having uh, better COP than medium pressure, and we can see that medium pressure having better COP uh, than the high pressure. So as the pressure increases, the COP of the refrigerant uh, decreases. Um, if we look now to the options and refrigerants, if we look for R1233ZD in particular, it provided opportunity not only because the COP is excellent, it is 8.85, and not only because it has a very low GWP, but also it enabled a more refrigeration capacity. Uh, I remember like five or six years ago, most of the district cooling plants and chillers were sized with capacity about 2,500 tons. Now, if we look to most of the district cooling plants, it is sized about uh, with the chillers with 3,000 tons. So using R1233ZD enabled to get more refrigeration capacity in, in the chiller and the equipment. 
And that contributed a lot because that made big saving in the footprint for the installation. So you can build more district cooling plants with less number of chillers. And that will lead to save in the footprint. And that will lead to save also in the installation cost. So R1233ZD really made a, a revolution in the, in the district cooling industry because it only not provided, as we mentioned, very high and excellent COP, but also it enabled the increase in the uh, chiller size. Uh, another important refrigerant that we come with is 514A, and this is a significant and important refrigerant because if we compare it, let's say, to R123, R123 has been used in low pressure and centrifugal chillers having COP of 8.9, and the 514A is very close in the terms of the COP. 514A is a blend of, of refrigerants, so it's very close to the R123. But the unique about it is that it's uh, it's also an unasmi pressure, it's low pressure, so it is really compatible with the R123. So for chillers with R123 in the long term, in the future, it can have retrofit with the 514A. Now, if we look for the medium pressure, many of the air-cooled screw chillers used R12 and then used R134A, and many has now options for 513A, which is having a GWP of 700. But we see here R1234ZE is, is the significant one, as a matter of fact. Uh, the R1234ZE is significant not only because it's having a very low GWP, but also of uh, energy efficiency that in some applications, it, it provided really opportunity for energy saving, as we will see in some examples later. Now we see that R1234ZE, as we mentioned, is classified as 2L, but its burning velocity is, is zero. So as we mentioned, Europe is considered as non-flammable. Another refrigerant which has been used widely is R1234YF. Maybe R1234YF, even though it's not very common known for us here, it maybe it has been used even before the R1234ZE and maybe even before the R1233ZD. And the reason for that R1234YF has been used widely in the mobile air conditioning, I mean, for the vehicles. Now, as we see here, the development of the low pressure and medium pressure uh, happen. There are more developing happening in the, in the high pressure uh, refrigerant coming as well. Uh, refrigerant such as R32 has been for a while. Uh, it's classified as 2L. Burning velocity is 6.7 compared to the R1234ZE, which is, which is zero. Um, we have also, uh, if we if we compare, for example, here the the global warming and the low pressure. Now, in order to get more understanding of the low pressure, uh, another opportunity here, if we look for the energy saving and for improvement, is for the centrifugal chillers because centrifugal chillers in traditional in, in long time ago it used to use like refrigerants such as R11. And in Montreal Protocol, uh, many chillers used R134A because could not use R11 anymore since it's a CFC. So R134A has been used in centrifugal chillers, but as we mentioned here, by using R1233ZD and 514A, it provides an excellent also opportunity for not only for the environment impact, but also for energy saving. As we see here for centrifugal chillers, if we compare chillers using R134A um, versus chillers, centrifugal chillers using R1233ZD, we can see that R1233ZD is more efficient than R134A. So for centrifugal chillers, also it provided here an opportunity, the R1233ZD, to change from R134A to R1233ZD. We see most of the air-cooled and water-cooled screw chillers are moving from R134A to the R1234ZE. Now, another way to look to look into that, if we look to the refrigerants, if we have here on the on the left axis, we have here the normal boiling point. So the higher boiling point of the refrigerant, it means that it's a low pressure refrigerant. And the lower it is, it means that we have a high pressure refrigerant. So here we have the low pressure refrigerants and the bottom here we have the high pressure refrigerants. 
And on the x-axis, we have the COP. Here on the right, we have a higher COP. And on the left, we have the lower COP. And if we put, let's say, the refrigerants and the available options uh, to compare it, we see here a kind of relationship, correlation between the COP and the pressure, uh, as we expect that the low pressure refrigerants is having a better COP since it is on the right area, such as R123 or 1233ZD. And as we see here on like the high pressure, which is here on the lower side, it's coming on the left. So for example, R134A is having a lower COP compared to the R1233ZD, but it's having high pressure. Uh, R1234ZE is slightly uh, lower pressure than R134A. Uh, COP is uh, is very close and very similar to the R134A. Now, uh, the reason why, as we go with lower pressure refrigerant that is more uh, energy efficient is that the higher the pressure, it means that the compressor has to work harder for energy of the compression, so it will use more energy, so it will be less efficient. And when we have a lower pressure refrigerant, it means that the compressor has to work less hard to compress the refrigerant, so it will consume less energy, so it can be more efficient. Now, as also as we move, let's say, from high pressure to low pressure refrigerant, we have lower leakage rate of the equipment. And as we say, as we mentioned earlier, that the refrigerant is enclosed inside the HVAC equipment. And another important thing now to look into not only the refrigerant uh, characteristics such as ODP and the GWP, but another important aspect to look is the log leakage rate of the of the equipment itself, because the lower leakage rate of the equipment it means that the equipment is more tight and it means that there is no emission to the to the atmosphere. So this is even better. So by using low pressure refrigerant, we achieve two advantages. One of them is better COP, and another important advantage is uh, lower leakage rate of probability. Um, as we mentioned here, the, the higher pressure is used in scroll compressor, a medium pressure is being used in the screw compressor, and lower pressure is used in the centrifugal uh, compressor. As we mentioned, uh, some using R134A with centrifugal, maybe we'll switch back again to the, to the low pressure such as 1233ZD. This is what is expected. Now, if we break, um, we, we, we look to the refrigerants from low pressure, medium pressure, and high pressure. Now, if we classify, let's say, the equipment here into large tonnage, medium, and small tonnage, we see here on the left the large tonnage centrifugal chillers, which is normally using low or medium pressure refrigerants. It has the best efficiencies. Normal centrifugal chillers are coming from global manufacturers, and it has a long uh, lifetime, like 30 years. This is the lifetime of the equipment. So as we see here, centrifugal chillers is having the most important impact of using refrigerants. So this is why it's actually leading the change. And this is why now the fastest developing and uh, fastest, uh, fastest, let's say, a change in phasing down of HFCs is ha has happened already in the centrifugal chillers or large tonic chillers. The second one, which is following also the, the centrifugal or large tonic chillers is the medium uh, tonnage. Uh, medium tonnage such as air-cooled and water-cooled screw chillers, it's normally used medium or high pressure refrigerants. So the efficiency is less than centrifugal chillers. It's medium-sized chillers available from both like uh, local manufacturers and the global manufacturers. And its lifetime is about 20 years design life. So it has still has significant impact on the environment, but less than centrifugal. So it's also following at the second one or can we or, or we now we can see it actually moving in the same speed as centrifugal chillers. As I mentioned, centrifugal chillers has already has already been there and screw chillers already happening. We have now uh, many chillers commercialized with R1234ZE rather than R134A being used also in UAE and commercialized in Europe and in, uh, in the Middle East. Now, the last category is the uh, residential air conditioning and unitary. And we expect that this will be, let's say, the, the last one to happen in the change by changing refrigerants. Uh, as we mentioned, like most of the room air conditioning and unitary has been developed, let's say, from local manufacturers. 
and the lifetime of the unitary is about 10 to 15 years, so it has less impact on the lifetime and the environment compared to the chillers, which is having bigger refrigerant charge and, uh, and longer lifetime. Now we come we come to the last topic of, uh, of of our presentation, and we will see let's say some refrigerants and applications. There are many examples and applications, but uh, we will talk about like for example two examples. One of them is the data center, and we see now exponential growth in data centers. Uh, the world is using more data, using more communication, more and more. So also the transformation of economy. We see more digital now. So we see now the, the, the world is, is changing and uh, the, the data centers is having exponential growth. Now data center IT equipment like servers and uh, IT equipment it requires a significant amount of cooling. And uh, that can be about like 25%, if not more, of the energy cost of the, of the data center and operating center. So operating cost of data center is significant for cooling. Uh, and that improved, and that this makes the energy efficiency of the cooling system is very important for the data center. It makes it paramount uh, from two points of view, from economy point of view, and also from environmental point of view. So now we see data center load also is different from the comfort cooling. If we, let's say, get, let's say for the comfort cooling application at VSC industry, for comfort cooling, we, we need temperature like in the room, which is like 24 temperature, we need about 50% relative humidity. So normally the design of the chilled water system is in the range of leaving water like five or six degrees. But for IT equipment, it's a different case. We have a high sensible uh, load of the IT equipment, the design of the air for cooling in the, in the, in the equipment or the precision cooling zone can be a higher temperature. As a general, we see a trend to, to, to design now the data center about 10 to 15 degrees warmer than previous, warmer than before. This is in order to achieve a better energy efficiency of the, of the cooling system. We will see here an example. This is, let's say here, an example of the manufacturer uh, chiller selection. So we have option one, option two, option three. If we select the chiller based on 18 degrees leaving water temperature, or if we select a chiller at a 22 leaving water temperature, and for example, if we see the ambient is 48, which is very applicable to our region. And if we compare here the chiller, let's say capacity and the power input. So um, as you see here, as we increase the leaving water temperature of the chiller, we can get more chiller capacity of the same equipment. So this is, let's say here, about 10%, we gain chiller capacity. And if we compare the chiller energy efficiency ratio, we have about 6% increase in the energy of the chiller by increasing the leaving water temperature. Now, increasing the low leaving water temperature can happen with, with any refrigerant, right? So you can use a chiller with R134A or R134ZE or any refrigerant. So in principle, increasing the leaving water temperature will improve the energy efficiency. Um, the important is to mention here is refrigerants such as R1234ZE is, is enabled, let's say, better chiller selection with higher leaving water temperature. So if we select a chiller with R134A, we will have more limitation in the leaving water temperature. Maybe I cannot go more, for example, 18 or 20 degrees, but well, I'm using R1234ZE, I can go 22 or 24. So using refrigerants such as R1234ZE, uh, not only is having very low GWP compared to the R134A, but also it enables using a higher leaving water temperature and improve the overall energy efficiency of the cooling system for the data center. So this is here and important. So here it, 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 it has two impacts, direct and indirect emission. In the direct emission, it's a reduction of the GWP compared to the R134A. And the second reduction is the indirect emission, which is resulting from lower kilowatt hour or annual energy consumption. Um, another less important segment that we want to talk about is about uh, heating. And I know that many would argue that, you know, we don't need uh, heating in UAE. Uh, yes, um, 
we would need, let's say, more space heating in other countries, but maybe you, we still need uh, heating for, uh, for example, for the sanitary, for domestic hot water, uh, sometimes for ventilation reheat, uh, sometimes for space heating, sometimes for uh, swimming pool. So there will be some requirements for, for heating, especially for the domestic hot water. And if we see like for sources for heating for the sanitary, such as in hotels, such as in hospitals, normally it will either come fossil fuel like boilers, but when we are using boilers, we have direct emission to the environment because we are burning gas. So that will result in direct emission such as carbon dioxide, nitrate oxide, and sulfur oxide, and also particle matter, which will affect, let's say, the environment. So it has a significant, let's say, direct emissions. One more thing that the efficiency of the fossil fuel cannot of the boilers in the range of 100 or less than 100 percent. Now, another source which is used is the electric calorie fire. So in this case, we have electricity and we use, let's say, one kilowatt of electricity. It will generate about one kilowatt of thermal. So if we have electric calorie fire, which is producing 500 kilowatt of heating, normally this would need about 500 kilowatt of electric, assuming 100 percent also efficiency. Now we see here an increasing trend of using the heat pumps. And the heat pumps is really a sustainable and energy efficient solution, which is gaining more and more momentum. And the market is transforming using heat pumps to meet, let's say, the, the requirements for domestic hot water. It's because it has inherent and important advantage. It's about the efficiency. For heat pump, we have one kilowatt of electricity. It can generate about three kilowatt of thermal energy. Now, if we see here, for example, let's say the chilled water system, and we have here air cooled chillers, the supply and return temperature, 12 and 7, and we have here requirements for heating. For example, maybe we need, let's say, about uh, uh, 500 kilowatt, or maybe about four or eight hours a day for meeting, let's say, the hot water demand. Now, if we were using electricity, we would need about 500 kilowatt. Or the other way is to use heat pump. Now, somebody may ask me, what is the relationship now between, let's say, the heat pumps and about, and, and about let's say, the refrigerants? Now, <clears throat> the, the limitation that we had in the past is about, let's say, the hot water temperature from the heat pump. And many heat pumps, let's say, the temperature that you can achieve of the, of the hot water in the heat pump, it, had, it has been limited like to 50 degrees or 40 degrees. And that was not really good enough because in the domestic hot water, we need to, to keep the temperature about like more than 60 or 65 in order to prevent the legionella growth. So now the, if we look here, the significance of refrigerants such as R1234ZE and the importance of it is that it enables using the heat pumps to provide hot water temperature. So we see here, for example, a selection of a heat pump. And that heat pump is, is giving chilled water, let's say, 712, so it's providing cooling. And at the same time, it's providing hot water at 70 degrees, which is 65 and 70 degrees. So now we can really use the water source heat pumps using refrigerant, which is R1234ZE, to meet the requirements of the heating demand of the domestic hot water. So the using of refrigerant, such as R1234ZE in heat pumps, really enabled the concept of the decarbonization of building and enabled the concept of the electrification of heating of the buildings and had a very important significant uh, on, the, on the carbon dioxide. So for example, if we are not using a heat pump, we would need about 75 kilowatt for uh, power consumption in the cooling. We would need about 275 kilowatt of power consumption for heating. That would be total about 350 kilowatt. Now, we can achieve all of that only using 100 kilowatt, because of when, we, when we use a heat pump, we can get about 275 kilowatt of heating, 168 kilowatt, and the power consumption is 100 kilowatt. So the saving is 250 kilowatt. If we assume that two heat pumps will be running for four hours, this is about 2,000 kilowatt hours a day of energy saving. So as we see here, the development of heat pumps using the new generation refrigerants, R1234ZE, uh, enabled, let's say, a considerable energy saving and saving emissions to the, uh, to the environment. So in summary, um, HFCs are greenhouse, are, are greenhouse gases being phased down. 
uh, as per Montreal Protocol, Kigali Amendment. Uh, each country has its own regulations to comply with the required reductions. Uh, we saw that European uh, Union is leading the HFC phase down. We see that the changing in the, in the developing countries is can be uh, faster than expected. Uh, we see HF oil refrigerants such as 1233ZD, R1234ZA, and 514A provided excellent environmental solutions because it has zero ODB and it has ultra low GWP. Uh, we saw that some refrigerants are such as R1233ZD, they provided excellent opportunity, not only from GWP, but it provided extra chillers capacity, less footprint, and more energy efficiency. Uh, we saw some refrigerants such as R1234ZE provided opportunity for energy saving when we look, for example, for data center and we look for the cooling system of data center, it provides uh, opportunity for better energy saving. Uh, we saw some refrigerants such as R1234ZE it provided opportunity for decarbonization of buildings and electrification of, of, of heating that enabled uh, using of the, the, of the heat pumps at higher or elevated hot water. Um, so in summary, what we do to our plant comes back to us. Uh, it is uh, our total responsibility uh, to use environment, uh, energy efficient and environmental uh, sustainable solutions and to protect, uh, to protect our globe and environment. And thank you all for your time and for your patience and for your interest. And now we have the questions and answer. If you have any questions, we will answer your questions. Fantastic. That was a very informative presentation, Mr. Said. Yes, we've uh, received some questions, actually. And uh, I'll just tell them, ask you the question. Tom. So one of the questions we received from uh, Mr. Shetty um, was the production of HVAC equipment. Uh, I think this is regarding the, the phase out uh, section, the phase out section of your slides. Uh, the production of the HVAC equipment will be phased out, uh, but what about the installed equipment with uh, the green warming potential higher than 750 uh, GWP? Is there any mandate for phasing out of uh, HFCs established in the GCC? No, there is no mandate, let's say, to, to phase out uh, new equipment with the GWP higher than 750. Uh, we, let's say, some uh, some chillers uh, having 513A, 513A having a GWB of 700 and it's being used. Uh, but as we see, let's say the, the momentum is happening, not let's say with the 700 GWB refrigerant, we see that the HFO like ultra GWP is becoming more popular. It's being now used more by the HVAC manufacturers. So there are two here, there are many stakeholders here. There is. The first stakeholder is the refrigerant manufacturers who are providing, for example, the development of the refrigerant. And there is lots of innovation here and technology happening from the refrigerant manufacturers. And the second stakeholder, which comes also like uh, in line with the refrigerant manufacturers is the HVAC manufacturer. So as long as the HVAC manufacturers select, let's say, which refrigerant they will, uh, they will use. For example, some companies decide to use Chillers with R1233ZD, that depends about, let's say, the speed of the company to adopt that refrigerant. So that will affect really the market offering and commercialization for the new equipment. So we talk here about a new equipment uh, availability. And that will drive in the future, let's say, the consumption and for the refrigerants from service point of view. Uh, so like if we speak about the chillers with the with the school chillers right which is using medium pressure refrigerant uh, normally they are now using r1234 ze which is having low gwb about one yeah. thank you for that answer well, we have a follow-up question um saying what will the phase out rules and dates in GCC mainly for R134A recently used in centrifugal chillers, which can be installed within a couple of years. Um, the, the pros and cons is that maybe the chillers with R134 centrifugal chillers may be still available commercial wise. Uh, the cons is that it's becoming an obsolete technology. 
because it will be replaced by HFO refrigerants, as we saw already. Uh, so the cost of the maintenance in the future will become more expensive. Also, as a refrigerant and from environmental point of view, the R134A is having very high global warming potential. I mean, it's 1,300 compared to the options which is available now, which is having, let's say, less than one GWB. So from environmental point of view, it's not, it's not uh, that attractive at all. From technology point of view, it will be obsolete uh, very soon. From economic point of view, maybe it can be now less expensive than a new technology with R1233ZD. But on the long term, as a life cycle cost of the equipment, and later, its maintenance will become more expensive. So it will become more obsolete. I think also um, looking at it from another angle on uh, when, when you're accounting for your carbon emissions for, because there are a lot of companies nowadays, um, especially especially organizations here in the UAE as well, who have committed to becoming net zero. Um, and you know, the, when it comes to scope one, scope two emissions as well, you have to look at your refrigerant emissions. And if you're using uh, refrigerants, if you're, if you're a big developer, if you're a big asset owner, if you have uh, your assets that are operating with uh, the older refrigerants like uh, 134A, I think that's going to really, really push up your carbon emissions because the, the global warming potential for these refrigerants are, is really high. So I think that's also going to be a factor in, in phasing out these older generations. Yeah, I agree with you, Jason. Uh, as we see here now, there's increasing, let's say, conscious among the people and uh, companies about the environment. Uh, I can, for example, mention, let's say, a few examples like company like Unilever, okay, which is uh, on a voluntary basis, it, it, it decides, let's say, to replace all of the HVAC equipment <coughs> and its factors and operations uh, by new generation, uh, by equipment with a new generation refrigerants. So this is happening soon. And as you mentioned, we see, let's say, many buildings coming up with net zero energy building, which is, let's say, having a kind of uh, giving to the grid of the same of what's consuming of energy. So energy efficiency is important. And we also see a trend building coming, let's say, with carbon neutral footprint. Now, for example, in, in, the, in the company that I work for, for a train, we have something called sustainability objectives. And in sustainability objectives, we have one, one objective, which is called the Gigaton Challenge. And the Gigaton Challenge is to help our customers reduce the carbon footprint of the, of the HVAC equipment by 1 billion metric ton by year 2030. So this is a kind of, uh, kind of example where it shows, let's say, that the environmental protection is our collective uh, responsibility. Another, let's say, example is the have our operations, which is, as we mentioned, let's say, uh, carbon neutral. So by our operations, so that we give water more than we, we, we use water. So the net zero energy building and carbon neutral energy building, let's say, is becoming more and more popular. And this is an evidence of the increasing conscience between the people and the, and the companies about the environment. Um. Another questions, um, I, I'll sort of club these two questions together because yeah. So one of one of the questions is, um, uh, do you think it's time for to update chiller specifications for uh, with uh, HFOs refrigerants um, here in the market? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, I agree. Absolutely, yes. Actually, okay. in the market, many specifications, like which is using the new generation refrigerant. So there are many consultants who specify chillers with the new generation refrigerant. Yeah. And another question is the cost of the uh, equipment with new uh, generation refrigerants is expensive. Uh, how will these be equipped? How will this equipment be cost competitive? Um, not, not necessarily. I mean, like, um, there are many variables, it's very complex. So we cannot, let's say, <clears throat> we cannot say it's more expensive or less expensive. Uh, to be honest, yeah, this is a very interesting question. And the answer for that is uh, to, to honest, let's say honestly and transparently, doesn't necessarily to have to be more expensive, 
it depends about let's say case to case sometimes it depends about let's say the size of the chiller sometimes it depends about let's say the equipment size the type of the chiller so there are many variables here and as we see now with the time that the new technology it becomes more affordable and which is now existing now technology is becoming more obsolete and it's becoming let's say more more expensive there are many variables it's about the chiller size the chiller type the time and the changes happening it's all happening in the same time so yeah so not necessarily to be more expensive and i i also think um it, it's it's the economies of scale at work as well any if you have a, a, any new technology that comes out initially it is maybe at a premium but eventually as more and more uh people and organizations and projects start using those products and technologies i think the economies of scale kicks in where you know it's just that there's more production and more demand and that ultimately just drives down the cost of of these newer technologies yeah and another important thing is also like we need to look not only for the uh, first or installation cost we need to look to the life cycle cost of the equipment because this will change the many things i mean like uh, for example if you buy a centrifugal chiller the lifetime of the chiller is about 30 years if you evaluate the life cycle cost of that equipment it's totally different way of evaluating when you are looking only to the to the new equipment or initial cost because during let's say the next 30 years some variables will happen about the refrigerant price about the energy consumption so these things are becoming more important factors the initial cost becomes a very small factor compared let's say to the operating cost so when we look to the life cycle cost we will have a different perspective for evaluating our alternatives of the refrigerants and the equipment absolutely i i i agree on this and this is uh, definitely something that we should be looking more towards uh, looking at life cycle costs as opposed to just your upfront or capital costs of of your project um another question that we have is uh, a bit on the technical side but uh, it's quite a long question but anyways um so one the the question that we received is are the benefits of higher cop due to refrigerant alone which is a low pressure is passed on to the end user so th there's a bit of a a long segment but basically what the the person is trying to ask is um if you get for example two spe uh, specification for centrifugal centrifugal chiller one with low pressure and one with medium pressure if you see the net net effect they both have the same cop slash er so how how does this happen with all the selection parameters are, are still the same yeah okay um the, the refrigerant is only one component of the hvac equipment when you let's say when you are an end user and you want let's say to evaluate the energy efficiency you need to evaluate the energy efficiency of the equipment let's say you do it as a black box okay and i want let's say i don't know what technology is used i don't know what refrigerant inside is used i just want to evaluate uh, let's say the the cop in this case i evaluate the cop of of the equipment itself this is how much cooling capacity this is how much power consumption it has so this is here one approach this is as end user to look into that okay now then we need let's say this is one approach then we need to look to it into from different point of view now as equipment manufacturer we have many components which affect the overall cop one of these components is the refrigerant so if I'm using a more efficient, let's say, refrigerant compared to a less efficient refrigerant, that will impact the overall HVAC equipment efficiency, right? So if I use, let's say, for example, a more efficient refrigerant, if I use a more uh, energy efficient, let's say, drive and compressor and motor and bigger heat transfer, I can achieve overall a better energy efficiency of the HVAC equipment. And that will be important for the end user and customer, which means two things. Number one, lower energy bills because the overall energy consumption and energy cost will be less okay so this is important from economic point of view and number two we will have less annual energy consumption kilowatt hours per year and as i mentioned like kilowatt hour consumed by the building is coming from power generation plant for every kilowatt hour produced in the power generation plant 
we are burning fossil fuel like gas or uh, or diesel or, uh, or uh, another type of fuel and that means uh, carbon dioxide emission to the to the environment so that will indirectly let's say affect the indirect emissions or the carbon footprint to the environment this is what it means let's say to have a better cop refrigerant because it will have many effects later Another question we have is, would the energy saving using the new generation of refrigerants uh, be the same uh, across region to region? For example, would uh, it be the same in Europe as compared to our region, which is more hot? Sorry, again, just to be the question. Would, would the energy savings uh, from using the new generation refrigerants instead of HFCs be the same? in our region as it would be in let's say for example in europe so obviously the climatic conditions are quite different uh so this uh the question is would the energy savings be the same if you're using um would it be more or less basically hmm. um no actually the it's, it's very similar i mean like uh, for for example if we speak about centrifugal chillers okay and centrifugal chillers, uh, as we mentioned here, it's 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 a it's a very unique case because, for example, some manufacturer who used let's say low pressure refrigerant in the past, and continue to use low pressure refrigerant in the past, they achieved uh, a slight gain in energy efficiency, so maybe in the range let's say of three to five percent better, whether in let's say in uh, in uh, like uh, high ambient or uh, standard ambient conditions. Um, for example, some, some companies who used, for example, medium pressure refrigerant in the past, like R134A, and who will switch, for example, for chillers with uh, low pressure, such as 1233ZD, they have potential here to achieve about like 10 to 15 percent increase in the energy, in, uh, in the, in, or 10 percent, if not more saving in energy, whether it is, let's say, standard ambient or, or high ambient conditions. Perfect. Um, okay, sorry, we just received some clarification on the earlier question that I asked. So the, the question that the person wanted to ask um, was why and how uh, both low pressure uh, slash medium pressure refrigerants used in centrifugal chillers give the same COP in practicality, whereas in theory, they should have, the the better COP should be for the low pressure refrigerant. Does this mean that the chiller manufacturer takes advantage rather than giving the benefit of the better COP to the end user? So that that is the actual question. Yeah, but uh, but actually, if, if, uh, uh, if you compare the chillers, with low pressure with low pressure refrigerant, uh, not only refrigerant, not only comparing COP refrigerant, we find it actually more energy efficient than chillers with medium pressure refrigerant. I mean, I don't want let's say to talk in more details because I don't want let's say to be a more commercial uh, person. But I I have been selling in the past uh, centrifugal chillers with R1233ZD. And I had the privilege, let's say, to compare the chillers as overall performance using low pressure compared to the chillers using R134A. While the chillers of R134A can achieve 0.7 kilowatt per ton, the chillers with r 123 d could achieve 0.65 or 0.64 kilowatt per ton. And that was actually an evident and very important energy saving. So this is what I said, if you compare here, between R134A and 1233ZD, you have about like 5% gain in the refrigerant. But another, let's say 5% is coming from the drive because they, with R134A, you will need to have gear drive, you have higher speed. With the R1233ZD, you have direct drive. I don't want to talk more about, let's say, inside the equipment, let's say technology, but I could see in the industry, in the market, about 10, better energy efficiency of the chiller, which is using low pressure refrigerant. That's that's guaranteed. I saw it in the market myself. Fantastic. Uh, I think that's all for the questions we have uh, today for this webinar. So thank you so much, Mr. Said, for this informative and really, really important 
uh, webinar that you delivered uh, today morning. Uh, I think it really goes to show that, you know, there's a lot more need for awareness of uh, the Kigali amendments and how the market still needs to improve uh, its awareness and also start using these new generation of refrigerants when they're either specifying or doing their consultancy or uh, in their line of work. So that's it from our side. Thank you, Mr. Said, once again. Um, yeah, and we, we hope to see you for our future upcoming events. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for your time and interest. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Have a good day. Goodbye. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.